First stop, the Desert Caballeros Museum, searching for corroborating evidence. She asks Wickenburg native Dana Burton his opinion. Dana, I brought this pair of pants from the Levi's archives that I'd like you to look at. They belonged to Homer Campbell. Homer Campbell. And he bought these pants here in Wickenburg in 1917 at the Brayton Commercial Co. We don't know what he did for a living. And he did something amazing to these pants. Dana reads the clues. If he was a cowboy, he'd have worn them out on the sides. And he probably wouldn't wear them out anyway because he's wearing the uh, shaps. But a miner, he's padding himself so that when he's chopping rocks out of the cliff, they come down and hit against him, they'll bounce off. And when he's picking up big rocks to carry them out, they'll have some padding against those pants. I'd say for sure that uh, Mr. Campbell was a miner. This deduction makes perfect sense. Homer placed patches where he needed to store his tools and to protect himself from the heavy work of mining. Lynn is thrilled. Another mystery solved. It's like closing a loop. It's, it's like finding the final piece of a puzzle, finding out who done it. Only in this case, I found out who wore it. Coming up next, Lynn's quest continues, hoping to learn how Levi's becomes sewn up with another American icon, cowboys. It's just a fact. Cowboys wear blue jeans. But our historian sees these buckaroos and dungarees as a mystery. The case of how the West was worn. Lynn Downey is Levi Strauss and Company's historian. Her mission? Answering how these all-American icons became roped together. She checks the evidence. These 501 jeans from 1933. These very distinctive, whiskering kinds of looks are what you get, again, when you're sitting in a saddle for days and days on end, and also when you don't wash your jeans that often as well, and maybe the only water you're exposed to is some rain or some you know, river water going through the river on your horse. But this is so specific to the kind of wear that you'd see on cowboy jeans. It's the early 20th century. Country and Western radio stations ride the American airwaves. Will Rogers ropes his way into popular culture. And cowboy becomes as much a lifestyle as a profession. <music> Levi's catches on. Yeah! Blue jeans didn't always dominate Western style. In the early 20th century, the cattle drive has a different look. They mostly wore woolen trousers. Even earlier than the cowboys, some of the frontiersmen um, wore buckskin pants. Cowboys testify that blue jeans are comfortable, yet tough enough for a rough ride. Wearing chaps is a chore, so it's really nice if you can have a good, tough pair of Levi's. Real cowboys wear their jeans in a particular way. We didn't have pre-shrunk materials in those days. So you'd roll up the cuffs and I'd use those for an ashtray. It was also a handy place to keep a package of cigarettes when you're riding so that you can reach it without digging into your pockets. Cowboy tales are the stuff of legend and the stuff television ads are later made of. Like this letter from Mrs. M. H. English of Otto, Wyoming in 1942. We found a man who had run off the highway and was stuck. We hoped to get him back onto the road, but had no chains or rope to pull him with. Finally, we found a pair of old Levi Strauss and tied one leg to our car and one to the front of his. Those types of tales make Easterners' fascination with the cowpoke grow. City slickers visit dude ranches, spreading the gospel of Levi far beyond the 11 Western states where the jeans are available. When guests arrive at the Remuda Dude Ranch in Arizona, Dana Burden's family takes them shopping. When the guests would come in, they were never properly attired for riding and stuff in the desert. So we would get them into Brayton's Commercial and the other stores in town and make sure they had Levi's and proper shirts and boots and hats and all the gear that they needed to ride in the desert. 
Levi's wholesale catalogs encourage stores to carry their brand, while other brands go directly to consumers. Wherever you were in America, you wanted that cowboy look, and you'd buy it from Sears Roebuck or a range of catalogs. Meanwhile, Hollywood lassos cowboys in blue jeans together. The studio's California base, so close to Levi headquarters, makes them the blue jean brand of the movies. Really, that's what helped Levi's in particular spread outside of the West Coast. Even stars like John Wayne swagger in Levi's. John Wayne was one of the first big cowboy heroes that you really could see by his appearance that he was a real cowboy. Since the Duke, jeans tightly fit the movie cowboy's image. But Levi's hit a snag when films moved to color. The blue of the Levi's just jumped out. And the color consultants, they would die when they would see the rushes and see the... And they'd chew us out for putting Levi's on because that color is brutal. So we had to over dye, strip, strip the color out of them, over dye them, and, and do it that way, and that helped. By 1936, Levi's needs to stand out from the crowd. Competitors copied its riveted stress points, its back pocket stitching, and its tough-as-nails fabric. So Levi's adds its now famous red tab. Levi's needed something that made them look different. And they came up with the idea of a little red tag on the back pocket with Levi's spelt in white. And might not seem a very big deal, but every, practically every day Levi's has people who are trying to imitate it. For some, the red tab makes Levi's Levi's. It was staking a claim, saying that this is really our product. And one could easily tell that this was an authentic Levi's product from across a crowded room by virtue of that tab. Starting in 1971, the red tab changes. The E becomes lower case. It becomes the dividing line in the vintage clothing world. Big E means vintage, little E does not. Making big E pieces highly collectible. Even Western wear expert and author Holly Warren wants Lynn Downey's trained eye to peek at a piece she found. Hello. Hi. What have you brought for me today? I found this shirt and um, just wondering if I was wondering what year it's from. It's got the capital E oh. on the label. And I thought this was kind of interesting because it's got this Denim Family. I've never seen that before in any. Denim Family was a line that debuted in 1953. Oh, really? And I believe that's when this particular style of shirt debuted. It's called a sawtooth. Wow. This is quite a collectible shirt. <gasps> It's an extremely collectible shirt. Really? I have seen these shirts go for a thousand dollars on you're eBay. Kidding. Wow! How much did you pay for it? Can I ask you? Twenty-five cents at a yard sale in Nashville, Tennessee. Oh my God! It was just wonderful to see the look on her face, um, and know that it's still out there. Those pieces are still out there. Coming up next, Lynn's quest continues. Why did life during wartime change blue jeans, and how did life after wartime? Take Levi's in a new direction. Oh my goodness. How amazing is this? It is oh. the world's largest scavenger hunt. Oh, here is. In the quest to find Levi's place in history, this is pay dirt. 62 pieces of evidence Important vintage clothing and advertising paraphernalia are sold to Levi Strauss and Company. Shirts, coats, and pants, some dating back to the 19th century, bear witness to the Levi's icon. This is what we came here for. To Levi's historians Lynn Downey and Stacia Fink, it's thrilling. This purchase is a major acquisition, increasing their chances of answering how Levi's became an icon. These are beautiful. Look at the denim. Look at the denim on this. Look at the perfect oh, wear oh pattern. It's beautiful. Beautiful. If we were to buy these many pieces individually as they showed up in the world, it would probably be 10, 15, maybe even 20 years worth of collecting, but we're able to compress time all at once and have all these pieces come to us all at once. Ooh, look, Stacia. Oh. A one pocket. A one pocket, two a one. Look at that. 
Unbelievable. So where would you put that age-wise? So it's 1890 to 1901. Wow. Look at the arcuate, it's perfect. It is. There are about 23 or 24 pieces we are acquiring today that we have never seen before, we don't have in the company archives at all, and this is a priceless treasure for us to have.